Um, dude, I think even though we've only got 11 people here so far, I think we must just start and then people will just join in because um, I'd hate to run out of time. Um, awesome. So I'm just going to introduce you and then, yeah, and then you can start. Um, yeah, so, good That's afternoon, good. everyone. Welcome to this, uh, this week's session um, on the WSU uh, series. So we'd just like to welcome Simon, Dr. Simon LaRue, who's joining us all the way from Cape Town um, to, to be with us today. So Simon is um, working in anesthetics at Victoria Hospital and has recently started partnering with the Global, Global Surgery Foundation. Um, I'm sure Simon will, will tell us a little bit more about what he's doing there. Um, but we're really um, fortunate to have him join us today. Simon's also spent a couple of, couple of years working at Zitulela Hospital. So um, I don't know if you'd consider Zitulela rural, but um, <laughs> it, was, it was rural and is, is still rural in some senses. But um, yeah, he understands the frustrations and the challenges that a lot of us face in rural medicine. So Simon, over to you. Thanks so much for your, for your time. Hi guys, good afternoon. Thanks for, for all of you joining on your on your lunch breaks and, and what I'm sure are very, very busy days. Um, and thanks to all of you watching watching later. Um, I think um, first of all, yeah, thanks to to Dylan and everybody working with him to to you know to start this initiative. I think it's a fantastic, fantastic way to get people together sharing ideas. Um, there's no point that we're all doing our own thing in our own little corner. Um, so, so um, yeah, I, I hope I hope and trust that there's lots of conversations going around, uh, around the, you know, going on a, in the background as well, um, and that you guys are, are learning um, from each other's experiences. That is probably the most important, important part of this. And Dylan approached me to, to chat a little bit about uh, spinal anesthesia Particularly with the focus on the on the cesarean section, um, and it's a it's a it's a really interesting one because it's such a narrow topic, but such a crucial topic. And and unfortunately, we're not we're not getting it right. Um, we I'll show you a couple of stats later. But there's there's I mean, it's on the one hand it's frustrating, but on the other hand, there's some simple things we can do to to improve outcomes. Um, and and that's absolutely absolutely crucial. So yeah, as as Dan said, um, my name's Simon. I'm I work currently as an anesthetics MO, so I'm not a specialist. Um, I've got about 12 years experience in, in the state sector, about seven of those are in, in anesthesia. Um, I've got a real interest in, in, in anesthetics, but also in, in health equity um, and trying to figure out how we can improve healthcare outcomes for all South Africans um, and, and all people across the economic um, uh, spectrum. That's really, really crucial. And, and you guys out there are, are doing just that at the moment. So, so, so thanks, thanks to you. Um, all right, so yeah, that, that's my background. I spent some time at, at Zitulele. Um, I spent time in, in East London and I'm currently doing most of my obstetrics at Mowbray, although um, I'm employed by Victoria Hospital and the Global um, Surgery uh, unit at UCT. It's a pretty new unit um, and uh, Professor Salome Mashime and it's a, it's a really dynamic team trying to figure out how we can build surgical and that means obstetric, surgical and anesthetic uh, capacity um, in low and low income scenarios. Um, so so we, we are through education, through research, through advocacy and through implementation trying to, trying to see how we can help you guys do what you do best um, so that's that's our focus have a look at it um, google uh, global surgery at uct and you can get some more information on that afterwards okay so i know that your maternity ward does not look like this it's even even this doesn't give a give a a full picture of, of where you're working. It's beautiful. It's real. That's it's really in the diff, in the in the distance. And um, we we tend to, I think, in places like Cape Town and Joburg, romanticize the idea of rural medicine. Um, and yes, there are lots of benefits, but it's also the part of the country with the least resources, patients that are the the most um, destitute, and there's so much work to be done there. So so our situation often looks a bit more like like this. And I'm sure lots of you will recognize those kind of pictures. So just a summary of what I want to talk about. Um, we'll, we'll first talk about why. Why is this talk important? Um, 
uh, I've decided to focus on a, on a very narrow couple of topics. Um, I, I could, that said, spend a whole hour on one of these. Um, and, and I want to talk about spinal hypertension in particular. Um, the, the patient with PT or clampshire that now needs to go to theatre. The patchy block briefly, and then if we have time, we'll talk about the, the how, the step by step. But but I, but I, I think um, this will hopefully be the first of a couple of talks. We'll we'll talk not we'll, we're not today going to talk about the GA because that's just a whole topic on its own. We'll touch briefly on the management of the high spinal, but again, that's something that should be dealt with more extensively. Um, and the you know blood management uh intraoperatively for the obstetric case is another another crucial topic that we'll we'll, we'll hopefully get to at some some points as well all right so saving mothers 2011 to 2013 um the confidential inquiry into maternal deaths showed that anesthesia related maternal mortality accounts for two percent of all maternal deaths that seems small but it's a big number it's 105 um women that died um okay of those 71 percent were spinal anesthesia related okay so spinal anesthesia is not just popping a needle sit back do sudoku wait for the baby that's not the case okay the majority of these deaths were deemed avoidable and um what's really important for us all is that 55.1 more than half of those um occurred at district hospitals so that's something really, really mm -hmm. important to bear in mind. All right, so, so some global surgery numbers. Um, this is based on Lancet Commission done in 2015 um, that really shine the spotlight on, on surgery. Um, and global surgery refers to obstetrics, anesthesia, and surgery in general. So it, it looks at you know, what, what's happening out there. Um, 1.3 billion people are not getting um, the most best basic healthcare. Five billion um, people are not getting the safe and affordable surgical care that they um, deserve, what they need. Every year, there are 143 million operations that go undone that could save lives and prevent disability. And there are 33 million people that face catastrophic health expenditure due to payments for the surgery or anesthesia. So that's, that's huge. And that's what you guys are seeing every day out there, okay? So just a little, a little bit of a look, what are, what are we supposed to be doing in district hospitals? Okay, so Caesars, obviously, and um, those particular ones that are, that are um, over 35 weeks per progress of fetal stress. This is according to the ESMO national guidelines. That are, that's a really nice document to look at, by, uh, by the way. Um, elective at term and com complicated patients. Postpartum surgery, so there's 10 placenta, postpartum serializations, ectopics. Um, I'm working on a paper with um, a phenomenal anesthesiologist on how we can do rupture ectopic GAs or, or anesthetized rupture ectopic GAs safely. Um, so more about that later. Um, EVACs of the retained progress of conception and anesthesia for patients um, with the booking BMI less than 40 and life-saving procedures. So, so that's what you're supposed to be doing at district hospitals. Some, sometimes you'll do less, sometimes you'll do, do more. What are the competencies required? Okay, so, so in district hospital, you need to have an MO at least one MO with who's ex experienced in, in anesthesia or has a DA. Um, that's, that's, that's what they recommend. And that often won't be the case, but that's what they recommend. Um, you need to be able to recognize when this patient needs to go to specialist care, be able to provide GA for elective and emergency surgeries um, for ASA one and two patients. Spinal anesthesia, and we'll talk obviously about that a bit more and, and knowing how to manage those complications. Provide safe and adequate post operative analgesia, monitor these patients um, and manage them post operatively, and manage, be able to deal with respiratory issues. So, those are, those are, that's kind of what's expected of you. Um, and, and that's just, I, th I think that's a useful starting point to know what, what are we, what, what's expected of, uh, and, and what can we work on. So, who are you not? expected to 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 um to do anesthetics on okay so patients with a predictive airway difficult airway class three or higher or atlantic patients upper upper centers 
comatose, status epilepticus, place enter previa, respiratory. Now, if uh, this was an audience, I'll ask you guys to raise your hands and ask who has done these patients in this hospital. And I suspect most of you will raise your hands. Um, a rupture placenta that, that goes, okay, unless the patient is bleeding or unless the um, a baby's at risk. So essentially all that ruptures you'll end up doing right where you are, okay? And, and so often you do, you, you do things way above your, your, your level of expertise um, because you're trying to do a life-saving procedure. So that's really, that's really crucial, okay? All right, we, we often, before we get into the nitty gritty of the how and the why and the you know, exact details of what, what to do, um, I want us to just pause for a second. And I feel like this is a very um, family medicine moment. Um, and we need to think about the patient because we can talk about these things um, theoretically and uh, that, that doesn't really help us. Um, so, so I want us to 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 think about how, as we go into these these um, spinal spaces and sections to to really see how we can involve our patients and and I'm just going to take a slight tangent here and talk about and show you a little video that was shot at Mowbray Maternity Hospital by Jessica Postel Jones and and Rowan Dace that essentially is a information piece for for patients and this will be available to you as well. So let's have a quick look at that before um, we we go further. Simon, I'm not sure, but the audio doesn't seem to be coming through on my side. Oh, really? That's, uh, is the audio not coming through? No, right. I'm not, I'm not so, getting any audio from it for some reason. I don't know why. I wonder, I wonder if that's to do, if maybe, maybe it can't be on my side and your side simultaneously. Let's skip that then. Um, it's a really cool tool that I'll, I'll forward to you guys. Um, it's compressed to WhatsApp form. You can take on your phone and you can show patients uh, what they can expect going into theater. Um, Dylan, you've seen it. Um, there's also for those that needed an English transcript. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's something that's, that's, that's quite, quite a nice little tool. Sorry for the audio. Thanks for letting me know. Cool, cool, cool. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about um, spinal hypertension to start with, okay? It's common, um, it's got a, up to 70% incidence, okay? So that's, that's huge. It's important, it, it causes nausea and vomiting for the moms, causes loss of consciousness, cardiac arrest and, and death. Um, so that's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. Um, and read the statement with me. Substandard treatment of spinal hypertension and associated complications are responsible for up to two thirds of deaths that occur in South Africa for cesarean sections and the spinal. So that's, that's, that's hectic. All right, definitions. You might have a bunch of different ones. I've often used the systolic blood pressure um, and MAP variation of, of more than 20% drop. Uh, some, you might find it simpler to use 90 millimeters mercury or a MAP of 65 um, for your patients. It obviously depends on their, on their baseline. Bear in mind that a uh, baseline for a patient that's in, in labor and in pain coming to you is, is possibly gonna be a bit higher than you expect. Um, but but um, just just before you even start your operation, think about that threshold. When are you going to start responding to to um, your spinal hypertension? Okay, your heart rate of over 120 or increase in 20% from baseline, so that's a nice thing to work out before, um, may also indicate impending hypertension. So consider sort of treating early and and prophylactically. Okay, that's going to be a constant theme when we talk about spinal hypertension. Let's get in there early. Let's try and help mom feel a bit better, let's try and make baby less acidotic um, and, and uh, you know, just stay on top of things. Okay, how do we predict spinal hypertension? Okay, so there's a nice little study out of South Africa that looked at PR, so pulse rate, age, and MAP as, as factors that um, 
if you don't look at them, have a 53% chance of developing spinal hypertension if all three of those factors were present. So, so just, just to think about, about that, that's really, really quite, quite a useful little tool just to, to give yourself a, a, a heads up. Um, that said, you're always going to be thinking about spinal hypertension in your, in your patients uh, going for, for spinal for CESAR. Um, just a brief note on this. There's some debates about the, the dose of um, spinal as my guidelines are total volume of two. So heavy bervican 1.8 plus 0.2. Um, and, and we suggest that you stick with that. So some people are using higher doses. That's what, what, what's done at Mowbray, for example. In the UK, they use even up to 2.8. Um, um, but you know, the, the risk with that is that you have, have even worse hypertension. Um, the benefits of a, of a higher dose is that you, you, potentially your spinal will last longer and you'll have less breakthrough pain. Um, but there's no guidelines at the moment are two moles total. So please stick to that. What's important is that we're not adjusting for, for extremes of height. So we are adjusting for extremes of height. So, so I tend to, as, as soon as the height drops below 150, I tend to go down with my total volume to, to 1.8 or 1.6 even. Um, but we don't adjust for BMI. Okay, so that's that's pretty that's pretty crucial. So that, that's one way of, of of being a bit safer. Um, what's really nice here is that there are a couple of things that evidence, lots of papers have shown, really really help to prevent spinal hypertension. Um, the 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 one is co-loading. The the next is is wedging. Um, and then. Our particular concern is the appropriate use of, of vasopressors. Um, just a, a brief talk about co-load. You might have heard the terms preload and co-load, and, and um, for a long time, preload was seen as this crucial thing. Give people lots of fluids before you put in the spinal. Um, and, and the problem with that is that, especially your crystalloids, kind of get redistributed and excreted really, really quickly if you give it um, pre your spinal. So what you want to be doing is, as the spinal goes in, you want to open up your your liter and a new liter and um, we often like to give a, a nice warm liter um, of, of, of ringus lactate and get that in there before the baby comes comes out that's really a, a, a nice a nice option okay so that's crucial and of course this goes for the, the normal healthy patient um if it's a patient that's in cardiac failure that's a different story completely um, and it's a patient that's shocked and fluid behind you should also consider giving them fluids preoperatively this is to help prevent um the hypertension just after the spinal. Okay, wedging. So, so, fifteen percent tilt. Um, that's that's the goal. So you're gonna put in your spinal. You're gonna put your patient flat into the back with the the shoulder just slightly higher than the buttocks, and you're gonna lean over and you're gonna put something under that right hip. Okay, and that just prevents aortic cable syndrome. So it, it just takes that you just off, prevents a bit of venous pooling uh, and, and helps you preload um, um, to, to recover recover nicely. So that's that's really something simple but crucial. Um, and then appropriate vasopressor use. Um, so, so let me pause there because I, I know that we are going to now talk about phenyl and you guys can go flip, we don't have phenyl ephrine. Okay, we, 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 um, we might not even have ephedrine microplaces that just have, have adrenaline. Okay, um, and that's not ideal. And we're going to try and talk a little bit about the, the alternates there. Um, but, uh, but I'll talk to you about what we'd like to do. Um, and then we can talk a bit about what we, what we do, what, 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 we, what we have. Okay. So four scenarios that I want us to discuss. Um, the first is hypertension with the increase in heart rate. So, so that's the most common one. You, you give your spinal that causes a sympathectomy, your peripheral vasculature, especially your arteries, but to a certain extent your venous system dilates, your, 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 and therefore your blood pressure drops and you get a, get a slight increase in heart rate as your baroreceptors picks it up. So, um, dilation and a tachycardia, hypertension and, 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 a, and a tachycardia. What do you do for that? Okay, so, so understanding how it happens helps us decide what we're going to use. Okay, phenyl is a fantastic drug for this kind of a scenario for our standard drugs. Okay, um, it's got alpha one specificity, so it, it, it's kind of opposing what we've done. It goes and sits in those peripheral alpha one receptors, causes vasoconstriction. 
awesome. Um, we use it for our GAs as well. It's a really, really good first line um, vasopressor. Vaso um, let me see what I've got on this next page. Okay, so let's just have a look at that table quickly. Okay, I've scratched out metraminol and noradrenaline because that's not really, really useful for us in our context. Um, but look at phenyl. Okay, so you have alpha one receptor. It works directly on those receptors. It's immediate, and it doesn't last particularly long. So you'll find that you'll need to give give more of that. Okay, so that's 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 a really useful just thing to think about. Hypertension and bradycardia. Um, this is rare and you should be worried if this starts to happen, okay? Sometimes you can get a bit of a bradycardia after you've given your phenol as your baroreceptors picks up, but the BPs are getting better. You get a reflex bradycardia. You might've heard that term before. Um, and the, you know, this is different. You, you got high, you know, hypertension and you've got, got a bradycardia and, and that's something to, to be worried about. So it's, it's normally caused by vagal, vasovagal response. And here you wanna reach for your, your anticholinergic agents like your GLAC or your atropine. Um, Dylan, to answer your question, we, we, we don't at this stage have a preference between the two. Most of the guidelines are suggesting atropine and are still suggesting atropine. So re reach for that. Uh, we can look at the dosage a bit later. Um, or ephedrine. Okay, ephedrine is, um, also a drug that works really, really well. Let's have a look at that table. So it works on beta, it works on beta one and two. Um, it, however, has indirect weak effects on specifically on your alpha receptors. And it's quite long before it, it kicks in, although it does last a little bit longer. Um, so that's that's just something to, to bear, bear in mind with, um, with ephedrine. Cool, so third scenario, you have a persistent refractory hypertension despite doing what you've done in step one or two. You've given your phenol, you've given your, your ephedrine, you've given your, your anticholinergics. Um, so what are your differentials? Start thinking more broadly now. Perhaps there's undiagnosed hypovolemia, cardiac disease, preeclampsia, um, induced heart failure. And, and now you've got to think a bit broader. When you're going to call for help, you can get some fluids in, inotropic support or diuretics, depending on what your, what your diagnosis is so again yeah just looking at, at your alpha your adrenaline there your alpha one and beta effects it's direct it's immediate but short acting and then high spinal block with cardiorespiratory failure so this is a i said at the beginning a, a really really important topic um and, and i'm not going to talk at length about today because i'd like to talk a bit, bit more at length about later um but you you get you essentially get hypertension bradycardia um you'll 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 have a simultaneous respiratory as the as the guidelines say embarrassment um and 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 you, you can also have decreased consciousness as well as that level creeps up and and this is scary because this happens simultaneously you 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 have to support the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system um, uh, simultaneously. And you need hands for this and you, you need to have a really high suspicion um, for, 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 for picking this up early. Because the earlier you pick it up, the better you, you, you can prepare for it. Um, and, and, and that's really important. And, and you know, I, I, th I think um, we'll talk a bit about the kits and things you need to, to, to have ready. You'll, you'll need a bag mask, sorry, not BMW, BMV, uh, bag mask ventilation and, and uh, tracheal intubation skills on, on hand for, for that, okay? I do, I do want to talk a little bit about um, just the, the evidence, again, in various South African-based and international studies are that your phenyl is best given as an infusion. So, so during that time post spinal to when baby's out to to look at giving about 25 to 50 mics um per minute um and then and then treating treating on top of that with epidrine and phenyl bolus should you should you have hypertension so so if you're in a lucky position where you have an ivac or a or a syringe driver um that that's a really really nice option is to 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 Draw up your phenol and, and connect it on a separate line to the patients and, and run an infusion. That gives you one less thing to think about. Um, and that, that works, that works really, really nicely. And alternatively, if you if you don't 
have, if you don't have a syringe driver and you don't have an eye like you can, you can really borrow from the ward. Um, you do the same, you, you mix up your phenol in a 200 ml bag. So, so that gives you a, a solution of 50 mics a mil. Um, you'll draw up 10 mils of that. So in your syringe, you'll have 500 mics of phenol. You put it into your, to your, your liter bag. As the spinal goes in, you let that liter go in over 10 to 20 minutes. And that gives you um, a dose of 25 to 50 mics a minute which is really, really a nice, a nice option. Okay, um, so, so you're trying to get that in by the time the baby's out. That's, that's really, really useful. So perhaps a nice thing to try. Just be aware that with phenol infusions, you can get that reactive bradycardia. So, so just, 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 just look out for that. Um, and you can get occasional um, hypertension uh, kind of 150, 160s in, in the studies that they did. So just 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 watch for that and, and titrate it accordingly. Um, so just bring it down if, if you find that happening. Okay. Um, so that's that's a, so first choice, phenol. If you don't have phenol, then um, epidrine bolus is the way to go. Uh, it's difficult because you have this tachyphylaxis where with each dose of epidrine, your effects become become less. That so really is is problematic. Um, and you know the, the, the question then is, do you give an adrenaline infusion? There's no evidence for that at the moment in obstetrics and Caesar spinals. Um, so so um, I, I think the, the best thing you can do is try phenol if you can, um, give epidrine when you can, give fluids, um, wedge, and give those fluids in a co-load fashion. Um, and, and, and try your best to, to speak to you. I mean, you, you got to advocate for your, for your patients as much as you can. And I know it's hard when you've had a busy day, but try and speak to your pharmacist, um, try, try and um, uh, go up the, up the chain as much as possible because phenol is, is, a, is an essential drug and, and, and crucial. So um, yeah, I, I know it's, it's hard, but um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really tricky one and such a, such a useful drug to have. Um, Simon, I just wanted to say, like in, in our experience, we at Madhuleni, we were we were doing seizures um, with only access to ephedrine for a number of years. Um, and then uh, we had a family physician, James Porter, join us, and he was horrified that we weren't using phenol and, um, you know, made a noise about it. And very quickly, we were able to procure some. Um, and I think in the context of, you know, um, DCSTs and just, you know, being able to contact people in high places, um, there should be ways, ways for guys to access phenol, not necessarily only through your pharmacy, but also just through contacting, um, you know, people that are, are uh, tasked with supporting district hospitals and you should be able to beg or borrow or steal from somewhere. Um, yeah, so I mean, we, that's, after, that's we did, after we did get, get, get a hold of some, we've been able to have a fairly steady supply of it since then. Um, and then when things were running low, we'd be able to borrow from another hospital. Um, so, but it's just, it is good to emphasize that it is like a standard of practice. And once you've started using it, it's hard to go back. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, thanks for that, Dylan. I, I think it's, it's really hard for me to stand here in the, in the shadow of, of where scare and go, you must use phenol, but that's useful um, to, to, to go listen. It is possible. And we want to look at the positive deviance in your, in your environment, like where, what, you know, asked them afterwards, who did James speak to? Um, how do you do it? Um, because it's, 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 it's by hook or crook. Um, if it's possible, try and, try and, try and make it happen. And um, you really are advocating for your, for your patients and you're gonna make your own life a lot easier as well. Cool, are, are there any All right. questions maybe before we carry on at this point? Just yeah, so yeah, please do, please do. Any, please open, open to the room. Yeah, you're welcome to just speak or you can also post messages, messages on the chat. But maybe before we go into the next section, if people have questions on vasopressors or anything like that, um, now's a good time. Any questions? Simon, hi, John D here from Madulani. How's it going? Hey, uh, Johnny. Good to see you, man. How's it? Good, thanks. Um, so I'm also working from home, getting ready for exams. But I wanted to ask, in the situation of hypertension with bradycardia, some people are quite keen to use adrenaline. Um, but I, 
can I get your perspective on that, like in terms of the literature and your experience of it? Like atropine, best choice, first drug to go to, and ephedrine, another good one as well. Um, is there a place for adrenaline at all or probably best avoided or any wisdom? <laughs> so so it's, a good, it's a good question. And, and I might answer it in the context of me arriving at Mowbray maternity, um, you know, on a, on, a, on a normal morning. And I'll, I'll invariably kind of see the drugs lying there from the night before. And um, I'm seeing more and more potential, you know, more, more and more people are drawing up their adrenaline. So, so, so they're having it on standby. Um, I don't, as part of my routine um, drug uh, prep, uh, I don't, but I, I definitely see more and more of the regs doing it. And, and I'm not going to judge that. I think, I think, I think if, if somebody wants to have it as a, as a, a safety um, net, then that's, that's, that's completely, completely fine. Um, uh, obstetric theater on your own in the middle of the night is a pretty, pretty scary place and things happen really quickly. But to answer your question, at the moment, the, the, the evidence is for ephedrine and um, uh, anticholinergic. If you have this refractory hypertension, you might very well be in, in this situation where inotropes are indicated. Um, so, so, so while you're trying to figure out what, what the reason for this is, um, starting adrenaline is, is, is completely justified. I mean, the, the, the issue for us is quite honestly, not about, uh, what you are, are, are using, um, you know, but, but that you are doing something, you're being proactive about it. Um, because if we sit and we're trying to figure out how to treat the spinal hypertension, we're going to lose our patients before we get an answer. Um, so, so just a little bit of advice on, on adrenaline in, in um, general, um, a nice way, so, so the syringes that lie around in the theater when I arrive, um, they're generally one amp of adrenaline, so that's a thousand mics drawn up to 10 mils, which means in every mil you have a hundred mics of adrenaline, you then draw out one mil of that into another 10 mil syringe, you dilute that, and that gives you 10 mics a mil. So people use the nuts range as boluses. Um, uh, that's really cool. If you, if, you have a, if you have the option of um, a syringe driver, you can take a 50 mil syringe. And for if you put one amp in that and the leads to 50 mils, you get 20 mics a mil. And you can, you can run that to your syringe, syringe driver. Obviously, if two amps is double, that's 40, 40 mics a mil. So, so um, those, those are options. Um, but in summary, try and go phenyl, ephedrine, uh, anticholinergic and, and have your adrenaline as a as a as a, um, a safety net beyond that. Johnny, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Simon. Cool. Cool. Any other questions, guys, before we move on? Cool. Simon, I'll uh, let you know if anyone posts anything in the chat, but cool. please carry do, on. please do. Oh, yeah. And I mean just 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 um to pause there for a second and to to just say it's really been nice to, to see people from various hospitals on this chat um on this talk but also to to you know thank the guys from football for perfect stutterheim um it's just Gita and Umpamilelo hospitals for, for getting back to me with you know their issues it's really really cool to see uh, what your theaters look like and and what drugs you you have and what drugs you don't have and uh, where you've got a got a cool anesthetic machine um, and we just got you know uh, anime so it's, that's really important and it's uh, it's nice i think to understand each other's situations as well as possible um great so so this is a, a really common question um you have a patient with pet uh but you don't have bloods it's weekend or it's after hours you're not gonna get your blood results back in time the patient needs to go for 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 caesar for baby's sake um or for whatever reason and you don't quite know what to do um you've been told that platelets under 70 are dangerous um you you don't really know you're scared about doing a ga because you never do them um, and and that's a reality i mean it's it's a really pretty it's a scary place to be knowing you want to do the best for your patients but not knowing that if you do something like a ga and you have a failed intubation that they might be worse off and um, all right so 
I think I think the first the first thing is that that these PET patients still need their bloods. Okay, so 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 do those bloods. Um, anyway, so so the guidelines are six to twelve hours if severe, and you want those results within twenty four hours if not if not severe. Okay, um, and that's just that's just good. So 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 I'm not gonna. I don't want you walking out of these couple of slides going. Ah, we don't need bloods for a patient with PET. You still need those bloods. Okay. Um, what is deemed severe? Okay, so so according to guidelines, to national guidelines, headache, chest epigastric pain, discomfort, or visual disturbances, or clamshell, of course, or a, um, a systolic of one sixty or diastolic of one or one ten. Um, the reality is that epidural hematoma is very rare. Okay, so that should be less than one in two thousand, um, even in cardiopathic patients. So we spend an immense amount of time worrying about. Are we going to cause a hematoma and paralysis in our patients? Um, the thing we should be worrying more about is, you know, is it a good idea going into a Caesar for a cardiopathic patient that's going to bleed, become cardiovascularly unstable, and then need to be converted to GA from a spinal? Um, and if already on the spinal, how, how that's going to cause cardiovascular instability? So, so think of, think about the surgery as well. Um, that's that's really 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 crucial. Um, Spoke about a safe plate cut of above 70. Um, it's unlikely unless severe PT for, for the for the plate to drop below 70. So so I mean I, I put this question to to um, a colleague that I really respect um, in this regard and who's also worked a lot in rural um, and his his feeling was not severe disease and you can't get better results you got to, you, you do the spinal, okay? Um, and if it's severe disease and you can't do the bloods, then it's a spinal versus GA risk benefit, okay? Um, you know, you might, you might say the guys in regional hospitals do the GA, go in district, do the spinal. Um, but the, 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 the issue is that these questions need to be discussed. These patients need to, to be, be discussed. There's no, no black and white answer, unfortunately. Um, and it'll depend so much on, on your own capabilities, uh, whether or not you, you have a machine, whether or not you have the skills um, for, for, for GA. Um, just a side note, if the baby's deceased, you gotta be super careful, okay? Um, it might be because of a rupture, it might be a DICU patient, it might be unstable or cardiopathic from that as well. So just um, realize that the patients might be, be a lot, a lot, a lot lower um, as we are there, okay? Um, Dylan, you asked me the question about if bleeding time and clotting time are good surrogates for platelet function. Uh, the answer is no, um, they're hard to do properly. Um, they're pretty random number generators, and we, we we suggest you'd rather look at the severity of the of the the, the, the PET. Um, maybe yeah, let's talk about the post patient and then we can pause for for any for any questions on that. Um, so I mean, this is interesting. You know, we are we, a patient fits. Uh, there's a big rush to 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 get to theatre, um, but but the the latest consensus is that there's from obstetric and anaesthetic side there's there's less of a rush than what we make make out. Uh, the focus is to stabilise the blood pressure and let the patient wake up, give magnesium. Um, general rule is um, no spinal within six hours of a seizure, uh, just to be sure you're not dealing with cerebral edema. If forced into giving the anaesthetic, yo, it's hard. Eh? Uh, these patients' airways, they've invariably bitten their tongue. Um, it's, a, it's an issue. Um, and it's, it's really, really hard. Uh, I still remember um, where Monday morning being called for two fitting eclamptics right after each other, um, fully dilated, um, not being delivered by vacuum and, and taken into theater at Tulele. It was some of the scariest moments of my life. Um, so so these, things, these things happen. I can't. Um, Remember that they can still fit and bleed, and, and once you put the patient on the table, it's hard to convert from spinal to GA. So, so if you can, bearing in mind that, you know, um, bearing in, in mind that these patients should be referred if, if possible, um, just just uh, think think about that. But we know we know that none of these cases fit into a box. Phone somebody. Hopefully, you have a scenario where where you can wait um, and get blood. If you can't wait, um, I'll revert you back to the preeclampsia slides and, and continue continue with the with the spinal. All right, uh, Dylan, 
Any questions, guys? Any questions on that? So long. Um, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment just before I read the question from the group. Um, it's just it's interesting with that bleeding and clotting time. The um, it's it's part of ESMO. -y. Like it's it's been presented to us before as part of ESMO training for district okay. hospitals. Um, so it is fascinating that there isn't any evidence justification for it. Yeah. Um, so so the, the same person, I mean, I, I got that little nugget from the same person that really encouraged me to look at the ISMO guidelines. Um, and uh, his, his take was, no, it's just not good enough, unfortunately. Um, I, I'll, will, I'll have a look at that. I did not read that in the latest ISMO guidelines. I might have missed it, Dylan, so we'll, we'll, we can have a look at that again. Cool. Um, I just had a question here from Dr. Etang from Mtata General Hospital. Just a question on, on anticoagulation. Um, how long should a patient on warfarin or clexane stop before performing a spinal anesthesia for Caesar in the district hospital? Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure why that kind of a case is being done at a district hospital. Perhaps the right answer is that it shouldn't, but yeah. what are your what are your thoughts on that? So, so it's, a, it's a tricky one. Um, yes, I think the first thing is those patients uh, don't fall or would unlikely be falling under ASA 1 and 2 and should be referred, but we know that that sometimes isn't the case. Um, for for my, my next question would be, are they on therapeutic or, or on prophylactic clexane? You'll probably get the situation of therapeutic, sorry, of prophylactic clexanes of patients uh, needing, needing theater. And we say 12 hours. So we, we'd like 12 hours from our from our, um, our dose of 40 milligram subcut clexane before we take this patient to theater. Warfarin, if that patient's been, been um, you know, chugging around their warfarin um, and I don't have an INR, I, I, I really wouldn't feel comfortable putting a spinal in. So you'd wait for an INR, at least under two, if not under 1.7 um, before before proceeding. Um, if you are, are rushing to theater, then um, I think to discuss it, but um, if you if you can't refer, GA would be first option for, for patient on a warfarin um, unknown INR. Does that help? Yeah, that sounds good, Simon. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Nice. Patchy spinal. Oh, this happened to to all of us, um, and uh, it's it's just it's just like it's nasty, man. It happens so much in the beginning of your career where you don't feel comfortable with the with the with the GA, um, and it happens very seldom later on in your career. So, so you know, I mean, the, the general rules again from the ISMO guidelines are: um, if no effect after twenty minutes, you repeat spinal. So, so you're looking at no motor or sensory effect, no cardiovascular effects. Um, so, so really, really uh, think about that. Um, if partial block, you need to decide on your skills and your setting. Uh, Convergence to GA versus local anesthesia ketamine supplementation. There are no guidelines on ketamine infusion for, for, for um, cesarean sections, but we know that those happen. Um, and and, and uh, it's a really interesting it's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because you, you, you want to give the best care possible and you want to keep the mom safe. Um, so we know that that happens and, and ketamine supplementation does happen. Um, and that might be your best and safest option where you are. Um, and then, of course, I mean, like it's so easy that we, er, you know, everything is set up, you've done your spine, you've called your buddy to come do the, do the, the, do this every, uh, again, it's three o'clock in the morning. It says three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and now it's patchy. Just think, is this elective or is this an emergency? If it's an emergency, cool, you got to continue. But if it's not, then bail and, and do it later. Um, so, you know, counsel your patient properly. Um, but just, just think about that debate between elective and emergency um, surgery. Okay, that's that's really, really crucial. Just what's back to point two. What's the, yeah. what's the delay time frame? Like, you know, if you if you say we're, we're doing this case as the first case on the day at eight o'clock in the morning and it was like a very patchy spinal and you didn't feel like you could justify repeating it immediately and you wanted to delay, how many hours would you say you'd have to wait before you could repeat it? So, so your spinal normally wears off three to four hours. So perhaps build in an extra two hours there, say six hours later. So do it at two o'clock in the afternoon. I think that would be, would be reasonable. 
um, and if they if it, if they have recovered completely from that spinal. Cool. Um, cool. Okay, that's that's really interesting. I I, I want to talk to you guys a bit about sedation later as well. Um, I mean that that um, local anesthesia and ketamine supplementation topic is so so crucial because it happens. Um, and the trick is to know your drugs. Um, what I don't want you guys doing is going, okay, the spinal's patchy, so let's give the patient midazolam because then they're more chilled, but they've still got they've still got pain, and you know we feel better because they're dosing, but they still have pain. So so those are things to think about. Ketamine, I think, as you all know, is a really is a really useful useful drug. Um, it's not perfect, but it is it is useful. Anything else there on the patchy spinal um, or anything else? Um, I, you know, that, that, that kind of talks about the three major topics I wanted to chat about. I want to chat about spinal hypertension and what are our tools. Our tools are co-loading, wedging, and using a vasopressor. Um, phenyl F1 if we can, in an infusion ideally, ephedrine if we can't, uh, cardio accelerators like Lyco and atropine, um, and adrenaline as a, as a, as a last resort. I wanted to talk a bit about PT and, and, and knowing, you know, when are you feeling comfortable to do a spinal and when are you not? Um, and, and then a, a brief a brief approach to Apache spinal. I've got, um, uh, sure, a whole bunch of slides left here um, that, that look at what drugs you need, what equipment you need, dosages, step-by-step -step, uh, approach to, to a spinal. <laughs> With that, with that, are you guys keen to go through that quickly, or should we pause for questions? Then, um, yeah, I think let's just quickly um, answer two of the questions that I've got on the group here, and then yeah, let's, cool. let's press on. Awesome. Sure. Um, so, just quickly from Nteta Lelo, I'm not sure where she's messaging from. In terms of that repeat six hours later situation, mm -hmm. would you would you give the full dose of two mils, or would you reduce the dose? I would do the full dose after six hours. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and then just from um, your buddy Nicholas, fine. Um, he was, making... was is saying, was the red top tube clotting test mentioned? Okay, so we've covered that. Nick, you'll just have to go to the recording. We did go through that. Um, and then uh, Squiggy from Zitalela as well. Uh, okay, I think she's also asking a question that's been covered. Is there no place for a repeat spinal or the first spinal having a patchy effect? So I think Squiggy just six hours later, you can give the full dose again. Um, and then Zine, you asked about, can I ask about an approach to a failed spinal? Um, I feel like that was covered in that slide. Simon, I don't know if you want to quickly go back to it, Zine, just essentially those three things there. Um, I don't know if you want to quickly just go through that again. It seems like there's a couple more questions coming through about that situation it's definitely quite a common scenario in district hospitals i reckon yeah it is it is a really common scenario and it's it's often um related to to uh drugs and um i think i think one of the things i'd say is you know if you if you so let's pause there for a second when you're doing your technique um make sure you've got good flow coming back. Okay, so that's, that's, that's crucial. Um, before you draw up your, your um, heavy pivot can, mix it, okay, so that the dextrose can, can dissolve in your pivot can. And if you have an issue where you've got, um, you know, repeated patchy or dodgy spinals, um, consider, consider mixing your own or um, consider getting getting a new a new batch or using a new batch that might be in the hospital with a different batch number. We 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 get that occasionally that some batches are just not lacquer. They they've you know along the way they've chilled in the sun or something's happened and we don't we don't get a um, a nice batch and you just have to to put those aside. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that the main thing is if you can don't put in don't inject intrathecally if you're not sure. That you're in the right space, all that flow is coming back. Um, that's that's really really crucial. Um, that's 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 absolutely essential. So so consider conversion to GA. Consider your 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 local anesthetic and ketamine supplementation, depending on where you are in your operation. 
um, and delay surgery for 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 spinal. Um, I mean, just to answer Squeaky's question, I know there's some there's some debates about um, can you give half the dose if it's a patchy spinal. Unfortunately, I haven't come across that in the the, the most recent literature. I'll, I'll have a look a little bit of a look more because I think I think um, there's obviously. Uh, a, a couple more questions about that, but um, this is this is this is what we what we got. Um, sorry that it's not uh, broader than that or easier. No, that's cool. Awesome. Um, shall we shall we carry on? Um, yeah. Like it's it's nine minutes too, um, so I'm going to carry on and Jesus stop me if it gets long. This is this is not a not a particularly exciting part of the talk. It's a it's a lot of. Uh, equipment lists and drug lists, um, but it is useful. And I'll try and pause at the crucial moments. Um, what I want to say is uh, get the national ISMO guidelines and print out the page of essential kits, essential drugs, and even your step-by-step seizure -step laminated or just pluck it up against the wall in the theater that you know what's supposed to, supposed to be there. If we don't start with a list of what we need, then we can't we can't we can't build on it and and being I mean that's that's such a crucial part of our, our planning and our um, yeah being prepared. All right, so long list, crucial stuff. If you don't have a wedge, use a vaculator. Uh, sexual is important. Having your recess equipment like your defibrillator is crucial. Um, and and all these these things I know are not all of your theaters. You know you, you might you might have a machine but no oxygen or nitrous in the wall. Um, but these are the things we want to want to work towards as much as as, as possible. Um, just just to pause when you put on your monitors and your patients. I really like to put on your NIBP SAS and ECG before you start your your spinal um, BP and and SATs, obvious reasons. ECG just every now and again you'll pick up a funky rhythm that you didn't pick up before, um, and it's just good to know that before you put in a spinal uh, tilting table. Not going to be available everywhere, but uh, do what you can with uh, vaccinators under the mattress, for example. Okay, um, it, it is nice to be able to tilt that table if you if you if you have a high spinal or you want to access the airway more quickly. It's 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 a it's a nice it's a, it's a very nice thing to have. And Equipment. Just, just, um, just could quickly add something there. Um, I, I know that it's not on the list there, but um, a pressure bag is something that's not very expensive, but we found. Um, at Madrileni, it's such a useful thing to help that co-load come in, go in, um, and it's, I'm sure it's something that we, you know, we could try and help people to acquire. You know, if um, yeah. if people don't have a, a pressure bag, I don't know how much they they cost, but um, yeah. it's definitely That's a, it's a really it's a really cool tool. Absolutely, uh, Dylan. Um, the 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 studies that looked at phenyl putting that 10 mils or 50 maximal of phenyl in a bag if you put in an 18 gauge and free, freely running um uh drips 18 gauge you will get that total volume in in 10 to 20 minutes that's the time you need it for uh, so for, for those purposes um i mean I, I'm, I'm with you i always felt Chisha, uh, um, a pressure bag is, is kind of essential to do the car load effectively but the studies didn't use them and, and and had really good effect just with a with a free running 18 gauge um, just 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 as an aside but it is useful it's a great piece of kit to have for your unstable bleeding patients um, to get fluid in really really quickly um, I'm all for getting stuff in your theater that frees your hands it just means that you don't have to stand there squeezing the bag um, so so it's a, it's a it's a cheap piece of kit and very useful. Right, so this stuff is, is important. You have know, bag masks, your oropharyngeal, your face, different size face masks. And, and yeah, it's probably a good time to pause and just talk a little bit about um, the GA and it ties in with the, with the conversation about high spinals. Um, and I'm so tempted to talk about that a bit more, but uh, you don't be petrified of bag masking a patient that you think you need to tube. So what that means is most of our obstetric patients or all of our obstetric patients will be, you know, classified as patients that need rapid sequence inductions. And that's, and that's for good reason. They have big uteruses, they are lying flat, they have not been fasted, um, their low esophageal 
sphincter is not doing that well um, and there are massive aspiration risks. But I want you to pause and think, what is more important? You know, aspiration sucks. It really isn't like a, but brain death is a lot worse. So, so just, just really think about that for a second. So, so do not hesitate to, to bag mask a patient if you, if, you, if, if, if you don't have the time to get your, your, your intubating equipment, if you don't have um, the, the skills for it. Um, there are a couple of ways you can make your, your ventilation safer. Um, and that is by popping an oropharyngeal airway, um, applying cricoid pressure nonetheless. So your cricoid is the only ring that's complete, pushes down your esophagus. So theoretically, if you then bag mask somebody, that oxygen goes, that volume goes into the lungs and not into the stomach, it doesn't inflate the stomach, causing the risk of aspiration. Um, so so that's that's a nice little trick. And then crucially to to use small pressures um, when you when you bag. So put your APL valve at 10 to 15, your your low esophageal sphincter in a healthy patient. So of course that when an obstetric patient, of course, um, it's 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 about 20 centimeters of water when that when that low esophageal sphincter opens. So so um, to, to build in a bit of a safety factor, just use low pressures at about five to ten um, centimeters of water when you when you bag mask your your patients, and that buys you time to get your kit ready, call for help, find your LMA, and 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 secure that airway. But don't not do anything. Have sats drop um, just because you don't want to bag mask a patient that should get a rapid sequence. I, I hope that makes I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, equipment, so functionally lowering scope, different size blades. I love a bougie. If you can get a bougie, uh, another piece of cheap kit, it's really, really useful. Um, particularly in the scenario where you we just see that um, epiglottis and you want to put the, the bougie through and then you can railroad pass your tube over it. It's, 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 it's saved me many times. So, so that's great. Um, really useful McGill's. It's always on the list. I don't know how much we use them. Um, I use them for nasogastric tubes, which I, by the way, I think are the hardest part of anesthesia. Um, then, yeah, the rest are quite simple. Um, some of you that gave feedback about what your kits say, say you don't have LMAs, and, 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 and that's something I put on really high on your list of stuff to get. So that's three and four LMAs are just crucial be it an agile or a super um or a, or a pro seal um or just a normal one uh it's it's a, it's a really important piece of kit to have in your in your in your um repertoire um cool and then states and cracko crack sets um it's worth worth looking at um yeah 20 droppers sharp containers this is all just the, the basics um other stuff hp so most of obstetric patients coming for seizures just need an HP. I get that. So you'd also like to check your HP intraoperatively. Um, oh, 25 or 26 gauge pencil point spinal needles. Um, oh, <laughs> I know these are not always available. I know um, I did most of my spinals. I think I did all of my spinals between two gauge um, quinkies in the Eastern Cape. Um, so it's 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 not great. Um, and can cause a lot of posterior puncture headaches. Our patients are so stoic, they, they seldom complain about them, but just, just, just think about that. Um, and if you can get hold of them, they really are, are, they do make your job a little bit easier. Different sizes are also important. Um, that's really, really crucial. Um, and have a good way of recording. And if you, if you, if you don't have an anesthetic record, we can find something for you. Um, and I wanna put on this list also a WHO checklist and, and that's a whole different talk, but having a checklist for these anesthetic pre-induction at the end of operation is so crucial to, to improve the level of your, of your care. This is a nice little table. So if you look at the red at the side here, draw up for every case. I, I, I draw up epidrine phenol. I don't draw up my induction agents, but I have them ready. I um, don't always drop sucks, although if I'm on my own and I worry that things will happen quickly, I would drop the sucks. The same for the atropine and oxytocin. They draw it up in a formal solution. I draw it up, um, I draw up 10 moles, 10 units in 10 moles. That's one unit per, per mole. Um, and this is just a useful little tip. So I give 2.5 units slowly after the baby's delivered, uh, followed by 7.5 units in a thousand moles. Let that go through the rest of the operation and then start at 20 units in a thousand mole 
um, solution post post up um, over eight hours. Okay, that's that's crucial to to help prevent PPH. And um, what drugs to have around? So your adrenaline, your morphine, your VEC. Um, we don't have VEC or uh, atropurium. We, no, we've got some cyst atropurium. We we use rocuronium and cyst atropurium. Essentially, have your reversal agents around. Um, and again, this is, you might be going at this list and going, Flippy sits in Cape Town, he doesn't know what we have and what we don't have. This is this, this is the, the ISMO guidelines saying, this is really crucial to have. And, and you, you should be able to, to get this to your, your pharmacy or by hook or crook, like, like Dylan was saying, um, during the, you know, with the guys to phenol as well. Um, and that's our, our spinal. So heavy marcaine, so heavy pivocaine with dextrose, 1.8 mole. 1.6 mils if very short or obese. Obese, that's been been kind of disproven. Okay, so don't don't worry about the obesity. That uh, you adjust for height, not for for BMI. And then the fentanyl makes your makes your block just a little bit more dense and it's really really nice to have. Okay, so that's what I kind of have in theater. Um, before I go, okay, um, some antibiotics. Some local that I drop in a five mil syringe. I use my smallest needle possible to inject that in the back. Um, my two and a half or three mil syringe um, with bupivacan and my fentanyl. All the goodies, phenyl, ephedrine, adrenaline, sax, atropine. This is a 25 gauge potential point 90 mil needle with the introducer and a little bit of and um, propofol ketamine and etomidate. Um, so, I mean, I, I, know, I know that looks great and you, you wish you had that. Um, I want to encourage you to try and try your best to get a hold of it um, and speak to your buddies and the rest of these. Okay? Maybe, maybe, you know, if you speak with one voice, there's a better chance of, of having success. Um, but on that topic, it really is interesting for me to hear what you guys have and don't have on that. So, so do let me know afterwards um, if, you, if you can. Uh, it's really, that'd be, be just, just very interesting. Um, all right, so basic rules, thorough, thorough preparation, including that equipment list and drug list. Uh, Pre-off assessments, don't rush it, be sensible, use your clinical skills, and to acid prophylactics. At, at um, Mowbray, we, just give 30 mils of sodium citrate. Um, though there's evidence of ranitidine and metoclopramide, and I did that as an intern, but we, we don't. We just use um, sodium citrate. Um, careful contraindications uh, consideration. So, so patient refusal, infection sites, shock, hypovolemia. Um, these are all, all crucial things, and, and, and coagulopathies, if you, if you know about them, is also obviously essential. So, yeah, this is just some pics from our theater, the stuff. Uh, this is on my tray. It's a shop and just out of view and a little container for the Hibbertsane um, also on that trolley. Good. So we've spoken about this. Most complications of spinal anesthesia occur from your, your hyper, you know, um, from spinal in the hypervenemic patients. So be very aware of patients that have been, had prolonged labor, uh, delayed second stage uh, with a ruptured uterus. Um, I, I will never forget the night um, we uh, spent with a lady um, with a ruptured uterus at, at Zitalele. Um, it was a team building exercise to say, to say the least. Um, yeah, signs of sepsis, tachycardia, tachypnea, fever. Um, and then just really think about a patient that has a heart rate more than 100 and be extra cautious if that heart rate is above 120. Simon, can I just stop you there for a second? Um, yeah, so absolutely. We've, got, we've got into two o'clock. So I think um, yeah. maybe Simon and I, we, we, we can just carry on until, until the end. But obviously, if you need to go, then that's fine. Can I just yeah. ask that you um, just put your, your name and your contact details in the chat so that we can, can get your details? And then um, I know Simon's got some, some resources that we'd like to send you. Um, if Yeah, I think it would be helpful to access that stuff. So just in the chat, put your name and email address, cool. and then we'll send it to you. Um, and then I think we're just going to carry on. But if you need to go, then by all means, feel free to leave. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thanks for everybody for for attending during your lunch break. Really, really appreciate it. And good luck for the rest of your your days. Let's. All right. So just talking about from the beginning, step by step. Minimum. Um, a free, freely running 18 gauge IV line. Uh, if there's a risk factor for, for bleeding, a 16 gauge, and consider a second line as well. 
um, ringers is our fluid of choice. Um, do a proper volume assessment and correct what you can uh, pre-spinal. Uh, that's prior to your co-load on top of that. On arrival OT, um, do, do your, oh, have I skipped a page here? I have. Uh, I'll go back to that page in a moment. On arrival OT, just give your, your BP, do your BP sets and ECG as I described um, and discuss with, with somebody that heart rate's above 120 is APH or the sets are, are less than 94% on room air. Just this one, um, do not give a spinal. So these are con you know, con continuing from our contraindications. If the heart rate's more than 140, if there's um, APH, if the patient is already hypoxic, okay. So, so just, just, just pause. Those are proper, proper warning signs, okay. Um, ensure sterile technique. There's really good videos on what to do if you feel uncomfortable with the technique. You're not sure you're doing it the right way. Think about um, looking at Nysora in New York Society of Regional Anesthesia. They've got just a nice step-by-step -step way of doing a spinal. Um, first liter, aim to have this in by the time the baby's delivered. That's crucial. We'll do, we do our spinals in the sitting position. Uh, I visited a hospital in, in Sweden once on leave and they do them all in lateral, like that's the norm. And um, so, so it's just it's just interesting. Um, but I believe sitting is, is pretty, pretty international. Um, it makes it easier, at, the, at least for me. Um, get your monitors in place. Spinal needle that you have. Um, don't inject them unless you have clear CSF. Uh, think about you want to have your 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 that drug that 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 volume of two mils, um, and you'll you'll anticipate a level of, of T4, so it's kind of nipple line uh, level. Um, don't inject during contractions. Don't uh, barbitage. So that's if you go if you pull in and out and in and out the whole time. Sure, it's cool to look and see if you're still getting flow back, but your risks of a high spinal are just, are just pretty, pretty, pretty real then. So don't, don't, don't do that. Um, and inject slowly over, over 20 mils. We normally say one second for every 0.1 mil. So that gets you to, to 20 to 20 seconds. Um, and, and I mean, this is for me almost the most important. You remove the needle, you cover that site, and then you just do three things and, and, um, if you spend a day in theater with me, you'll know that I just, I just, I just hammer on this. Um, you know, most interns are awesome and they want to get rid of their shops immediately. So do the spinal and they rush to the bin to check their sharks away. Don't, don't do that. Stay with your patients, position them, wedge in, um, get your NI, your blood pressure running every minute for the least, for the first 10 minutes at the very least. Get, make sure your IV fluid is still running, get that co-load in. Okay, so that's just crucial. Stay by your patients and um, maintain communication. Um, our patients tend to be stoic, they don't complain. They are not going to tell you if they're feeling short of breath or dizzy or nauseous. So invite them to communicate with you. That is so important. Okay. So, 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 so you have a short period of time to get to know this patient um, and you're really looking after them. Um, so you need, you need to pay attention to them. Um, and, and just to hammer in this again, at the first sign of a complication treat as of hypertension. If, that, if, if you remember nothing else from today, then then just just remember this. If the patient feels nauseous, says she is feeling faint, she stops talking. Treat hypertension, and and I'd like to take it a step further and just check. You know, are they breathing well? Can they squeeze your hand? Can they put their finger on their nose? That gives you an idea of of if the spinal is going high or not. Okay, crucial. Uh, Cinto. We mentioned that on the drug table, 2.5, make sure there's no there's no baby, uh, no second baby in. So, so just confirm with your obstetrician. Um, we we just realized that the Cinto can cause a bit of a hypertension. So, so if you're if you're already a little bit hypertensive, consider giving your Cinto with 100 mics, two mils bolus of your phenylephrine or of your of, uh, of your ephedrine. Um, Cinto in your second liter, let that run in towards the end of the operation. So you get your infusion starting earlier and and crucially call for help earlier okay um treatments we, we spoke about this okay so 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 general rule let the flows run um we we spoke about you know you know when, when i learned how to do anesthesia this was this was the, the ongoing rule if, if you if you had nothing else to go by think about giving ephedrine if your heart rate's below 70 so that's that second slide with hypertension and bradycardia 
and if it's if it's more than it's if it is like kind of a tachycardia and hypertension give give phenyl um and and up to 100 mics by this is, is, is normally the way to go Cinto, all right different ways of doing it but make sure you give 2.5 units followed by 7.5 units in the drip and 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 that then is followed by 20 units in a liter ringers lactate cool uh, this is our little kit. I'm not going to play the video because the sound's gone, but this is a nice little box to get all your stuff together. Um, and just, this is kept under our spinal trolley. Um, so gloves, heavy marker and plain marker and different types of uh, needles, um, five mil, three mil syringes, um, and uh, some ether chloride spray to check our level and a selection of different needles. And so, so try it. Try, yeah, just to start somewhere, start with what you got, get your stuff together. Photos help, take a photo, put it up on the wall, um, uh, help help your your theater team to to help you stock that, uh, take it to your pharmacist. It really, it really is a nice little visual guide. I don't know, that's me. I had a video, but I'm not gonna take it through this. Um, we're gonna talk about airways at a different time, but pre-op assessments are just crucial. Fellow intubations are common. Um, remember to mask ventilate, remember your, your superglottic airways, um, and, 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 and really just look at your, your, your patients. Um, even if you're doing a spinal, don't think you're not going to do a GA. So look at the airway before you put in the spinal, especially in these days where, we, where we're wearing masks and our patients are wearing masks the whole time. It's easy to forget to look at the airway because ah, I'm just going to do a spinal. But then you have a reason to convert and you send me your in for surprises. So, so part of your pre-op assessment, just to do an uh, airway, airway assessment as well. It's so important. Um, okay, so we've already gone past uh, 12 minutes. So we'll talk about a GA for, for, for a steering session. Um, another time blood management and the management of a high spinal um, in the meantime i don't want you guys to not um look at that stuff so i'll, I'll put those guidelines on as well um, and you can you can you can have a look at them uh, so so long um okay so yeah most crucial thing is be prepared uh, have your equipment your drugs your knowledge that's what you're doing today so awesome that's a big step in your skills um ready treat hypertension early if you think something's wrong treat hypertension that's just really crucial call a friend early okay call call um one of us you can you're welcome to contact me with any any questions uh call your buddy at the at the hospital next door build yourself a network um of, of people that can help you make the right decision i still call people to bounce ideas sometimes just verbalizing something having a soundboard um makes things more clear in your head so don't don't be shy to to ask for help um and and uh, excuse the type of follow the guidelines there are some really really good ones out there um i just want to say a particular thanks to to dave bishop he's um uh, incredibly talented specialist in maritzburg um, and he's kind of given me an immense amount of advice for this talk he's involved with um a lot of obstetric anesthesia in particular um dominic van Dijk, also known as the Oracle here at UCT, um, knows a lot about obstetric anesthesia. That video I wanted to show you, but I hope you can access later is by Jessica Russell Jones and Rowan Days. PMB Way, awesome, awesome um, source. Uh, it's really, really, it's a Peter Marisburg way. They, they have some good touch on machine checks. They've got good touch on, on um, it's my, uh, it's really a, a nice way. There's my guidelines themselves um, and just, just some of the articles I, I, I built the talk around so it's so really crucial and and just to say some really some great people there besides uh bishop and van dyke um gibbs and um prof uh, robert died now retired and the emeritus professor he's there's a bunch of people that are doing really cool work trying to make and this easier better scenarios okay so so that's one second for me from from doing this reading is there's some some really good academic minds out there looking to make things better and and that's that's pretty that's pretty exciting um so yeah and then lastly thanks to you guys for listening and taking the time um, and asking questions please please feel free to to send me more questions and emails i will answer where i can and i'll quite happily say i don't know and find answers elsewhere if i if i don't have the answers <laughs>